Open your Bibles to Jonah 2. Working through the book of Jonah in the month of February, one chapter a day, or one chapter a Sunday. So we're in chapter 2 today. Um, Last week, you remember, we talked about Jonah running from God and being thrown overboard and getting eaten by the fish. Today, we read about when he was in the fish. Well, you're there again. You feel so bad about yourself. You did it again. You told yourself you never would. You told people in your life you'd never be back again. Yet here you are. Here you are. In the muck, in the mire, in, in, the, in the smell of your own failure, sitting there. Maybe you want to quit drinking and you, um, and you put down the bottle months ago and you said you'd never take it back up, yet somehow in a moment of weakness... You took a drink, and weeks later, you can't get through a day without three or four drinks. Maybe you've struggled with with lust. You finally got past it. You set up blocks on your phone. You had an accountability partner. You made it months fighting every temptation that came your way. And then one night, in a moment of weakness, you went to websites that you shouldn't have, and you spent four hours on those websites. Maybe you're prone to complain or have a negative demeanor like I often am. You wake up and and, and you're going to work as hard as you can to not complain today, to be joyful rather than grumpy. And you get dressed and you go into the kitchen and you're going to make breakfast, so you put a, a piece of bread in the toaster, it pops out, you grab it, you start buttering it, and then you realize you need something from the fridge, you set it on the counter, you walk to the fridge, and it falls off the counter and lands on the floor butter side down. And, you, and, and, and it just wells up in you, and you lose it. Ugh! Why does nothing ever good happen to me? And that little piece of bread makes the rest of your day spoiled. So you're grumpy with your spouse. You're distant with your kids. Every little thing sets you off. Every stoplight, every slow car, every slow service at, re- at a restaurant, it just all makes you a grouch. And you lay down in bed that night and think, I was a jerk today. And you can't sleep all night because of that. Maybe you're prone to gossip. You know it's wrong. And and, and you commit that you aren't going to gossip anymore. And then you're at the hair salon. And you hear someone in the chair, in the next chair to you talking about someone you know. And you try so hard to resist, but it's so juicy. It's like a slab of meat right in front of a dog. And you're just, no, don't, don't participate. But you pounce on it. And you're joining into the gossip. And pretty soon you're calling everyone you know and sharing about it. You're asking for prayer requests at church about it. And pretty soon you have spread it all over town, but the story you've shared is not accurate at all, and you've hurt someone's reputation in the process. You're now alone at your home, and it hits you that you've gossiped, and you feel so bad. How could you do this again? So here you are again, clutching a toilet after drinking too much, Two in the morning after you had a marathon of inappropriate websites, laying in bed thinking of how much of a grumpy complainer you were today, filled with remorse over the gossip fest you had today, you're there. Perhaps the thought you feel is, I've done something so bad, not even God will forgive me. Not even he will have me. I just need to sit here in the muck and mire and feel sorry for myself. Maybe in a few days, if I don't do this again, God will finally be okay with me coming back around to him. You have nowhere to turn. You feel like you are so far gone and the days ahead look grim. What do you do? Well, Jonah finds himself in that similar situation in chapter 2. He spent all of chapter 1 going down. You remember he went down to Joppa. He went down into the boat. He got thrown down into the sea. Now he is down as far as he can go. He's literally inside a fish. We didn't know that it was a whale. We often say it's a whale. That's that's what we say. the, The text just says it's a fish. Jonah finds himself in a pit of despair. Perhaps what happens to him can help you in those moments where you're at the end of yourself. So let's read chapter 2. Actually, I'm going to start in chapter 1, verse 17, and read through chapter 2. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to you 
out of my distress, and he answered. I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the, hearts of the, into the heart of the sea, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, will, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. Last time we saw Jonah, he was being thrown overboard into the sea. And the pagan sailors that were on the ship with him saw the storm that they had ran into. It just completely ended immediately when Jonah hit the water. Jonah's in the water and all of a sudden a fish eats him. He assumed if he got thrown in the water, he'd drown and die and wouldn't have to go preach to Nineveh. But God had other plans. God had other plans. He gets swallowed into a fish. He is in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights. That's a long time. That's a long time when you're in the belly of a fish. This isn't as we often imagine it. I mean, you know, I went on Google when I was preparing the sermon. And I typed in Jonah inside the fish just to see what popped up and you know, went to images. Every image of Jonah inside the fish has him sitting in a chamber crisscross applesauce with a fire lit inside the, inside the, the fish. That's not how it would have been. That, that's not how it would have been. So my favorite film series, as you know, is Star Wars, especially the original trilogy from the 70s and 80s. And you, get, you get to the third one of that, Return of the Jedi, and, and Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia go to rescue Han Solo from Jabba the Hutt, and they get caught. So they take Luke Skywalker and Han Solo out into the desert, and they say, we're going to throw you into the Sarlacc pit. The, it's, a, it's a creature that lives in the sand, essentially. And you're going to get thrown in there and eaten. And Han Solo says, that doesn't sound so bad. And then they say, in his belly, you will find a new definition of pain and suffering as you are slowly digested for a thousand years. And Han Solo says, second thought, let's pass on that. That's where Jonah would have been. He's not sitting in a chamber comfortably inside the fish. No, he's passing through the intestines of this thing. Like he's, he's being digested through this fish. He's being slowly digested through this fish's body. Remember, three days he's in there. Food does not sit in your stomach for three days. It, it starts to be processed. Jonah is being processed through this fish. He's scrunched up in a really tight position. If you're claustrophobic, I'm probably scaring you to death. He's, he's getting passed through these you know, intestines. He's covered in stomach acid. Food is being digested all around him. And frankly, you know what food eventually turns into. That's where he's at. I remind you, he's there for three days. No food, no water. Of course, God sovereignly kept him alive in this situation. Jonah's disobedience to God has wound him up in literal muck and mire. Skeptics doubt the story of Jonah, people who um, deny um, things in the Bible. Jonah is one of the stories that honestly skeptics you know, doubt the most um, because they say there's no way Jonah could have survived in the belly of a fish for three days. And from a literal earthly sense, of course, he could not have. He could not have. You have to believe in the miraculous to find this story valid. You have to believe in that. Frankly, there's no way Jesus could survive in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights with no food or water unless there's a God in heaven who can keep him alive by his sovereign power for 40 days and 40 nights. There's no way Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego can survive a fiery furnace unless there's a God in heaven who can, by his sovereign power, protect them from the flame. There's no way on earth that, that, that there's no way the earth itself can stop spinning so the Israelites have more, time, more daylight to fight a battle unless there's a God in heaven who can stop the earth from spinning for a few hours. There's no way 5,000 people can be fed by five loaves and two fish unless there's a God in heaven who can sovereignly make those fish and bread multiply. 
Most importantly of all, there's no way Jesus can rise from the dead. And no way you and I will one day rise from the dead unless there's a God in heaven who by his sovereign power can open up the grave. If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus, the story of Jonah is easy. The story of Jonah is easy. It comes down to, is there a God in heaven who can do the impossible? Who can override the laws of nature? Who can, who can do these things that we cannot do? Is there a God in heaven? If there is, we have every reason to not doubt the story of Jonah. It's legitimate, and it really happened. Some people think that Jonah is, is just a um, parable that was written to, to teach the Jewish people something. No, it, it, it's a literal thing. Jesus points to this story as actually happening historically. Notice the contrast of Jonah and the pagan sailors. Think back to what we looked at last week. How long did it take the pagan sailors to respond to God? Immediately. The storm ended, and they had a revival on their boat. They were repenting, they were praising, they were offering sacrifices. Look back at verses 15 and 16 of chapter 1. How long does it take Jonah? 72 hours inside a fish. This dude has traveled through the esophagus. He landed in a puddle of bile inside the stomach. He's probably been transferred into the intestines, and he's on his way to the bowel. And that's where he finally understands, I got to do something. I got to do something. Remember, it's the biggest truth of the book of Jonah. You're going to see it in literally every chapter. Everything in the book of Jonah obeys God immediately, except Jonah. Jonah's completely disobedient. Jonah runs from God every single time, and it takes him forever to come around. Jonah is imprisoned in a fish for three days, has a lot of time to think. I mean, he's got a lot of time. What else can he do? And finally, verse 2, he prays. Actually, verse 1, he prays. Finally, he prays. He's done nothing but run from God this entire book, and finally something clicks with him. Finally, he calls out. And we get to read his prayer, verses 2 through 9. He says, I called out, verse 2, I called out to the Lord, and he answered me. That's mercy in itself right there. God answered him. He does not deserve to be answered at all. Like, Like God has every right to just smite this guy, just crush him in the ground, just let him digest in that fish the rest of the way. Like He has every right to let Jonah do that. Jonah is a, is a moron. He's in the muck and the mire of his fullest decisions. He had warning after warning, and he never turned back. The storm should have been enough, but he didn't turn back. He finds himself where maybe you feel you are after you have fallen into that sin again. Maybe one of those ones I named at the beginning. Maybe something completely different. Yet He finds himself where you find yourself in that moment. You feel like God is distant, like God is mad at you, like he's done with you. Like, that's all I can handle. Like, he, they had this much, and, and they went all the way, and now my wick's just been burned out, and I'm exploding. Jonah calls out to the Lord, and the Lord hears him. He hears him. The Lord does not ignore him. The Lord does not shun him. The Lord hears him still. He still hears him. Jonah says in verse 2, I was in the belly of Sheol, and I cried out. Sheol, you may, you'll see that word a lot in the Old Testament. Um, I don't think you see it very much in the New Testament, but um, in, in the Old Testament, understand, um, it's, it's just how they understood the, where, where, the, where dead people go. Um, they understood there was a heaven and an afterlife, but, but a lot of the details about it didn't come until the New Testament. There, there's a revelation that happens over time with the Bible, where um, at this point they didn't know all the details of how it works out, so th- they just called it Sheol. It's the realm of the dead. It's where dead people end up in some sense. So Sheol is simply the place of the dead, the grave, the end of man. And Jonah says, that's where I was. I was as close to the end of myself as I could get. Jonah isn't in the belly of a fish. He sees himself as literally being on the precipice of death. His disobedience brought him to the end of himself. He's about to be snatched up by death itself, and Sheol is about to have him. And even in that moment, he calls out, and God hears him. God hears him. Much of his prayer, honestly, if you read it, if you, if you pay attention to it as you read it, much of his prayer is repeating the same idea in, in various ways. 
I called out to the Lord, even in my distress, and he answered me. It, it repeats itself about four times in, in some form. Jonah believes in a big God who has power and authority over death itself, and you must do the same. God, verses 3 through 6, he talks about how God, God literally allowed me to come to the end of myself so that I would turn. God allowed me to come to the end of myself. Don't believe for a second that God won't let bad things happen to you for a greater good. Sometimes when I pray for somebody who's far from God, I'll pray this, Lord, do whatever is necessary to get them to come back to you. And that might sound harsh, that might sound cruel, but the better thing for them is to be near the Lord, even if it takes hardship to get them there. God will do what is best for you. He has infinite wisdom to know what is best. Romans 8, 28, he causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him that are called according to his purpose. If you belong to Jesus, everything in your life that happens is ultimately being used for a greater good that you may not understand at the time. What is best for you is that you live within God's will, doing all that he has planned for you. What is best for you is that you repent of your sins and you battle them, not continue to live in them. What is best for you is that you follow Jesus faithfully, not just casually identify with him, but ignore him every time he disagrees with you. And so if you're running headlong in the opposite direction of that, of repenting of your sins and following Jesus, if you're entangled in a sin that will destroy you, listen, God may allow you to wreck your life so that you come to the end of yourself and have no choice but to turn back to him because he knows what's best for you and he loves you. He loves you. He may allow you to wreck your life so that you repent of your sins because he loves you, because it's that important. That's what he's doing with Jonah here. Jonah was running from God's will. He was on a headlong direction as far away from God's will as he could get. So God allowed him to come to the worst place possible, the intestines of a fish, to turn around. Look how Jonah describes it, starting in verse 3. The flood surrounded me. You know, picture yourself in this, you know, small room, maybe on that, uh, you know, those magicians that like get in the little chamber and the water fills up and they got to get un unhandcuffed before they die. Maybe, maybe he's like that. He's in a tiny room and the water's filling up. Uh, all your waves and your billows passed over me. Uh, verse four, the water, actually five, the water closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Uh, verse, verse five, the weeds were wrapped around my head. So like seaweed all around his head. The bars of this place, verse 6, closed upon me forever. It's like he's in a prison and he's not getting out. He's in a place where it looks like there's no turning back. He has arrived at the very end of himself. Perhaps you found yourself there before. Or perhaps you feel there now. Or perhaps there will come a day in the future when you're there. Notice the glimmer of hope within his prayer. Um, verse 4, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. It's like he, 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 he can't see anything. He's wrapped up in this fish, but he's going to squint through as much as he can and see the temple of the Lord. He's going he's gonna to do everything he can to look through and finally see it, and it's going to be there. It's going to be there. The, the curtains are not closed over this place, so he can't see it. It's still there. I went down to an eternal prison, he says, but you brought me up. You brought me up. That's verse 6. I went down to the land where the bars closed on me forever, an eternal prison, yet you brought up my life from the pit. You brought me up. When you reach that moment where you are at the end of yourself and nowhere else to go, what is your answer? It's look to Jesus. It's call out to Jesus. In fact, he's been at the point of no return before. Jesus has. He's been there. When he hung on the cross, darkness fell over the land. Uh, one could say the, 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 the flood surrounded him, and all the waves and the billows came upon him, and all the weeds wrapped around his head. That's what happened to Jesus when he's on the cross. He took that for you. He bore the full indignation of God's wrath, so you don't have to. He knows what it's like to bear that. So he can sympathize with you when you find yourself at the end of yourself. And he is able to help you. And he will come to your aid. You must call out to him. You must look to him again. 
and know that he's still going to be there. He's not going to shut you out. He's still going to be there. Verses 7 through 9 of his prayer, just basically, I was at the point of death, but salvation belongs to the Lord. That's the, that's the message he's saying in his prayer of 7 through 9. I was at the end of, uh, again, just repeating these same ideas over and over. I was, I was at the end of myself, and I called out to the Lord, and he saved me. I was at the end. My life was fainting away, he says. Look, verse 7, I was, I was about to go unconscious. I was about to no longer be uh, awake to do anything. And in that last moment of consciousness, I remembered the Lord, and I woke up, and, and there it was, and I finally called out to him. Everything was fading, but the one thing that could save me came to my mind. Nothing else could have done it. Nothing else. He remembers. I remembered the Lord. Remember, it's simply mental activity accompanied by physical action. He calls to mind who God is, and that changes his action. That changes his heart. Finally, Jonah, uh, verse 8, makes a comment about idols. He says, I remember the Lord, and he came and saved me. Those people who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Essentially, uh, the Lord came and rescued me because he's the one God. Those who worship false gods aren't going to have any chance of that. They forsake their hope of steadfast love. Idols wouldn't help him here. Uh, Idols would not help him. In the dark night of the soul you might come to, idols will not help you. They won't. Your wonderful job will not give you hope of the dark night of the soul. Your money and your bank account won't do it. Your iPhone, you can play on that thing all night. You're never going to be satisfied and you're never going to find hope. You know, the Super Bowl is not going to give you hope tonight if you're in the dark night of the soul, no matter who wins. Uh, Georgia Bulldogs and Atlanta Braves victory this year. The, The hope has faded already a little bit, hasn't it? Because it doesn't last. Even the best things of your life, your spouse, your kids, your family, they won't give you hope when you're at the end of yourself. In those moments, you may try to seek pleasure to give you hope. But, that, but, but at the end of yourself, they will be fleeting. Food won't last. Sex won't last. Binging Netflix won't last. There's nothing else for you to turn to at the darkest moment of your life. You must turn to God. You must turn to God. Because he says, salvation belongs to the Lord, verse 9. Salvation belongs to to the Lord. It doesn't belong to the idols. It doesn't belong to the things that we turn to for hope. It belongs only to the Lord. He's the only one who can get me out of this fish, is what he says. He's the only one. There's nothing else. It belongs to him only. In that moment, when you're at the worst point of your life, he's the only one who can save you. Notice a word he uses, verse 9. What I have vowed, I will pay. When's the last time we saw the word vow in Jonah? Well, it's verse, chapter 1, verse 16. Remember, this is after Jonah got thrown over. Then the men, the sailors, feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. Jonah finally catches up with those pagan sailors. It took 72 hours and a journey through a fish, but he finally gets to the point where the pagan sailors were at the minute the lights went out in the middle of the water. The minute the lightning stopped, the minute the thunder stopped, when the rain and the wind stopped, they got it. It took Jonah three more days. Jonah finally catches up to them. He finally wakes up. He finally repents. He finally listens to God. It took so long, but God finally broke through his hard heart. This is the great hope of for, to, to those of us who have loved ones who don't know Jesus. We, we all have loved ones who don't know Jesus, don't we? And sometimes it seems like they never get it. That They never get it. I mean, you could share the most glorious news about Jesus ever with them, and they are, they are just stone-faced. I mean, the, the, it, it just doesn't phase them. Or they flat out reject it. Remember that until they die, there's still time. There's still time. Pray fervently that the Spirit of God would bust through their hard heart and Jesus would finally be seen as beautiful to them through faith. 
Remember a couple weeks ago, I gave a challenge to you. Uh, I, I said, take a sheet of paper and write down a name or two names of people that you know who don't know Jesus. Write that down, put it in your Bible. Every day when you get up to read your Bible, there's the names, offer up a short prayer for them. I've been doing that since that day. I hope you have been as well. There's two or three people every morning. I'm just offering a short prayer. Lord, save this person. Uh, this person, cause them to finally repent of their sins and turn back to him. This person, give them understanding of the gospel. This person, uh, please help them. Um, so do that. Because there's still a chance of mercy for them. They, they may seem so far away. There's still a chance. There was still a chance for Jonah. There's still a chance for them. Jonah was in the worst place he could possibly be. He was as far gone as you can be. But the Lord had mercy. The, the Lord had mercy. That's the greatest point of the book of Jonah. God is rich in mercy. That's actually the entire point of the Bible. God is rich in mercy because Adam and Eve did something way worse than Jonah. They had everything offered to them and they had one command to obey and they broke it. And every one of us since has broken it. And we have, um, God, God had to make clothes for them to cover up their sin. And ever since, he's been covering up the sins of humanity until the cross came and he finally made a way back to him to restore us back to himself. He, he is rich in mercy. None of us deserved it and he gave that to us. That is the point of Jonah. That's the point of the entire Bible. There was mercy for Jonah. God Speaks to the fish, verse 10. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out onto the dry land. He spoke to the fish, and the fish was swimming through the water, and I imagine it starts convulsing, like something's moving around inside of me, and I don't know what it is. It squirms, and all of a sudden it vomits, and Jonah comes out. I want to imagine that it was kind of a funny scene, you know, like, like, you know, the, the fish vomits Jonah out, and he kind of, you know, shoots out of the water like a projectile, and we I don't think that's how it happened, though. I like to imagine it's like that, but Jonah, it, it probably, the, the fish vomited him out into the water, and the force of that caused him to emerge on a beach somewhere, probably back near Tarshish, where he's supposed to go, no, toward Nineveh, where he's supposed to go. It would not have been pleasant. It would not have been pleasant. Jonah's been hanging out in the stomach in stomach acid for three days, surrounded by all the other nasty stuff inside a fish's belly. He probably smells terrible. His clothes are probably worn down from the acid that he was in. He's starving to death. He's thirsty, but he's alive. He's alive. He was at the brink of death, and he survived. God's mercy won't always make your life completely better immediately. But his mercy will pull you back from the edge of the cliff. It will pull you back. It, it will rescue you from destruction, from Sheol, as Jonah says. And as you're going to see, this is not the last time God shows Jonah mercy. And so it's not as if you're going to uh, get away from that dark night of the soul and you're going to you know, just be good from then on out. No, you're going to need God's mercy again. <laughs> You're going to need it again and again. Jonah's going to need God's mercy again. When we get to chapter 3 and 4, it's, it's the same story as chapter 1 and 2, except this time he doesn't get swallowed by a fish. It's the same story. He runs from God again, and he needs God to show him mercy. There was mercy for Jonah, multiple times of mercy. I don't know if you're currently in one of those moments where you are in the muck and the mire, or when the next time you will be there is. Whether it's you're hugging a toilet because you gave into drinking, whether it's at the end of a binge of inappropriate videos, whether it's laying in bed thinking how much of a jerk you were today, whether it's great remorse over your gossip, or if it's something else, whatever, whatever the sin and vice that you struggle with is. When that moment comes, when, when you're at that dark night of the soul, remember there is mercy. There's mercy. Remember, you're not too far gone. You're not too far gone. Remember that no matter how dark the darkness feels, Jesus endured greater darkness for you. He did. He bore up under the wrath of God for every sin and every disobedience you would ever be consumed by. So that when the dark night of the soul comes, you can trust and look to Christ again. Every time. Every time. You can look to him again and he will show you mercy. <laughs> His expectation for you is not that you're perfect, it's that you're progressing. You're walking with him 
That is, you're farther along the journey than you were last time. Very often, the Christian walk is two steps forward and one step back. When you fall, when you trip and stumble, turn to Christ. Know that he forgives you. Don't sit in the muck and the mire thinking you need to have a spiritual timeout, that God's got to get a, have a couple days to get over his anger for you. No, seek out help from another person. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's a counselor. Maybe it's someone in the pew next to you. God expects you to be growing. He does not expect you to be perfect. Yet, someday he's going to make you perfect. And you're never going to struggle with that sin again. And it is because he is rich in mercy. So I'm going to pray in just a second. And then we're going to sing the song, His Mercy is More. Um, in the, if you're on this side, it was in your seat. There's a print out of the lyrics. If you're on this side, it's, it's in your pew rack. There's one per pew rack. Uh, it should be behind the Bible or with one of the hymnals um, there in your pew rack. So grab that. We're going to sing all three verses. I'm going to stand here at the front. We're going to sing the song together. Um, during this time... You may need to respond in various ways. Perhaps you don't know Jesus, and you need his mercy for the first time. Here's what you have to do. Repent of your sins. Confess them and leave them behind. And place your trust in Jesus and his gospel. He died on the cross and rose again to pay the penalty for your sins. Simply pray to Jesus and commit those things to him. Turn from your sin and trust your life to him and his gospel. Come tell me about that. I want to hear about it. Whether you do it here at the front or tell me at the door as you're going out. If you want to come and surrender your life to him with me, come on up. We'll, we'll talk about that. We'll, we'll, we'll work through that with you. Perhaps you need the Lord's mercy afresh this morning. Perhaps you already have it. You've been saved, but you need it afresh. Come to the altar and pray. If you're in one of those moments where you're at a dark night of the soul, cry out to him for mercy. He will give it to you. He will hear your prayer. It's a guarantee. He will hear. You're not in as bad of a situation as Jonah was, and he heard Jonah. Perhaps you're not in one of those seasons right now. Then sing this song with joy, that his mercy is more. The Lord's mercy is more. It is so wonderful, and this is great news. Would you pray with me? Father, we praise you for your mercy. We praise you for your mercy, Lord. As we're about to sing, our sins are many, but your mercy is more. You always leave the door open for us. You always leave a light on at home for us to come back. You always receive us back if we come back. Lord, we have until we die to come back. As long as we're alive, there's still another chance. And so, Lord, I pray that you would cause us to come back. If we are far from you, help us to know that you're not just waiting to beat us over the head when we get back. You're waiting to embrace us when we come back. So may we come back, Lord. I pray that for every person here today. If they are at the dark night of the soul, that they would come running back. If they're not there, May they rejoice in your mercy and go deeper in your mercy that when that moment comes one day, they will come back knowing that you're a merciful God, ready to forgive and ready to show steadfast love. In Jesus' name, amen.